أشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم رب يشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most peaceful, the most merciful I ask him tonight, insha'Allah ta'ala, that he unwind my tongue so that I may be understood, insha'Allah. And all I ask of you, insha'Allah, we have one hour together because we are running on Muslim standard time. I think a little bit behind, but are we, or is this the, we're good? So it's the real standard time for Muslims, being on time, alhamdulillah. And um, open your mind, insha'Allah ta'ala. If uh, there's people out there, and there usually are, those who are sitting there trying to write something down that a mistake or a, a slip of the tongue or something, they're just looking for something that you're going to say so they can call you names or they can say you're this group or that group. Please don't do that. If you're here for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will spew something that you will need to listen to. And many of our shiuch have told us that so many times we end up going down a path that we go off subject a little bit. And we realize at the end that's because one person came for that with an open heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him that which he came for. So have your intention pure to learn something insha'Allah ta'ala. It may not be much. I'm trying to fill up the shoes of Sheikh Hatim, Hafizahullah. He just arrived in Egypt, I believe, today. And um, so it's a tough task. So I want to borrow your ears, but mainly your hearts for the next hour insha'Allah ta'ala. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guide us all to that which pleases him. Amin. What we are going to talk about tonight, our subject is the manners of a Muslim. Now when we hear the word manners, we're all thinking, okay, I have to look good, smell good, not do anything bad, so forth and so on. And we will touch about that. But I want to talk about things probably on the higher level of a Muslim, that which every Muslim needs to know, insha'Allah ta'ala, and that is going to go a little bit along what you've been learning here in the Aqidah class with Sheikh Hatim uh, about uh, the Tawheed wa Rububiyah and so forth uh, and so on. But the first manner I want to mention is our manners towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The manners towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the most important thing for a Muslim to dedicate his life and his soul. That say that my nusuk, that which I sac my sacrifice in my prayers, in my life and my death. Meaning, what does it mean, my death? After you are dead, there is no more judgment. Meaning, comes judgment day, but there's no more thawab, there's no more ajr, there's no more. Um, what, what we call recompense. So the, the person or the human being, when he says, like Sayyidina Ibrahim salam said, is that my whole life was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then when I die, I will die on the shahada and the tawheed that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that goes right along with the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have surely created the jinn and the human beings for the sole purpose. What is that sole purpose? It's worship. And if we ask ourselves and we want to be sincere, when we live our daily lives, do we live to worship? Or is worship something we revolve our lives around? Or our li or are our lives revolved around the worship? Did I say that right? So does our life revolve around worship? Or does our worship revolve around our lives? That sounds better. So this is the question that I ask every single one of you. That I ask myself, especially in the West, especially in America. This, the hayat al-dunya, zinat al-hayat al-dunya in this country with that, in this country as an exceptional ground, you will find that getting attracted to this dunya is so easy. They even found a way to do it for Muslim these days. We give you 0% interest. 0% on your credit card, 0% on your house, 0% on whatever, 
anything you want to buy, 0% interest. It used to be three, four months. They figured out they got more clients, so now it's 12 and 18 months. So you get deeper and deeper. Subhanallah. But we're not here to talk about that and conspiracies and so forth. We'll leave that for another time, inshaAllah. But our manners towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَقَالَ عَلَى لِسَانِ لُقْمَانِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ uh, Luqman saying to his son, Ya Bunaya la tu shrik billahi in the shirk ala vulmun adim. Oh my son, do not make association with Allah. That association is the gravest of sins, is the majorest of sins, is the biggest of sins. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous verse says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive any sin. He is going to forgive any sin. The only sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive is association. It's shirk. And this association comes in so many shapes and forms. Many of you are saying, what are you talking about? We don't have the shrines like we do back home when people go and they, they ask this person because he's a good wali salih or somebody that's well known or somebody that was known for to be a pious man or even a sahabi and so forth and so on. Asking, make an association. No, I bring you the simplest of association. That every single one of us is capable of doing and committing, I should say, and surely falls into this category one way or another. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ara'ayta man ittakhada ilaha hu hawa. In another ayah, Afara'ayta man ittakhada ilaha hu hawa. Have you seen the pure, the he, meaning he and she, when we talk in Arabic and we say he, it's usually encompassing the male and the female, unless there's what a, a qarina or something that suggests is or suggests otherwise. Have you seen he who has taken his desire for a Lord? Meaning that this person, they follow their desires just like they follow their Lord. Whenever that nifs tells them to do something, they just jump right on it. They're the first one to be there. But when it comes to the salat, al-fajr for instance, if we were to ask a show of hands, but we will not do that, for who prayed Fajr in the masjid today? For the brothers and for the sisters who actually got up at the beginning of the time. We're not going to talk about Qiyam and before. No, we're just talking about the basics. And these days, these are not the basics. If you are praying on time and if you are praying at the masjid, you are min al-muqarrabin. You are of those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we compared to the rest of the people out there. If I only told you it's a small percentage of Muslims that even pray, we're not going to talk about the Friday Muslims, because we have a lot of Friday Muslims. Like, well, Ayyadu Billah Christians have a lot of Sunday Christians. We call them once a weekers. And even these once a weekers don't even come for the sermon, they come to pray the Turaqahs. So when they say the salam and they rise up, everybody sees them in the community. MashaAllah, you made it to Jum'ah, you're a good Muslim. Now, we're not going to mention the word Muslim because we already told you what that word means, right? Please don't call yourselves Muslim. Because the word Muslim in Hebrew means donkey. So that's why a lot of the Jews use that word as a connotation. But in parentheses, let's go back. All right. So you're a Muslim. So these manners that every single Muslim should have Towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, we need to worship Allah the way that Allah wanted us to, to worship Him. It's not the way you want to worship Him. It's not the way you want to worship Him. It's not the way I want to worship Him. It's the way He has prescribed through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to worship Him. And many of you know this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed the salat twice. Once in this dunya, in Mecca, and once in the seventh heaven, in the seventh heaven, directly to the Prophet ﷺ. And the ulama said that's because of the greatest of the salat, because of the greatness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, import, the importance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on the salat, that, he met, that the Prophet ﷺ went to the seventh heaven to receive the salat especially. And we know the hadiths and so forth and so on. But so we don't fall off the topic, insha'Allah. These manners that the Muslims should have when they are worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first of all, like we mentioned, they do not associate anyone 
nor anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing at all. And like we said, there's many things that the Muslim could fall into. And that's the love and the desires of the soul that we follow little by little. As in the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after creating the Jannah, He sent Jibreel alayhi salam. He said, Ya Jibreel, go and look at the Jannah and tell me what you think. And then Jibreel alayhi salam said, Oh Allah, who would not work for the paradise? Who will not go? Who will not want to go to Jannah? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had surrounded the Jannah with the makareh, with the things that we don't like to do, like the salat and the worship and the prayers. And then he said, oh Jibreel, go look at the paradise now. Go look at the Jannah now. And he said, oh Allah, I don't think anyone will make it to Jannah. حُفَّةَ الْجَنَّةَ بِالْمَكَارِهِ وَحُفَّةَ النَّارُ بِالشَّهَوَاتِ That the Jannah, the paradise, has been surrounded by things that are, are strong and hard on the heart, that they are a burden on the heart. In the word kalafa, in the word kalafa in Arabic, when we say at takalif al shariyah, when we say that these are the things that are decreed upon us or the necessary obligations upon us, this an obligation, anytime you hear the word obligation, that's something that is difficult that the heart does not want. It's something that the heart does not desire. For the majority. Now we're not, somebody might debate and say, well, there, if you become a muhsin, that the ibadah would become dearest to your heart. But even the muhsin, he will fall sometime. And he will commit a sin or two or a few sins. There can't be anyone purer than the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. So when we worship Allah according to what he wants, there's two things that make the deed accepted. Two major shurut. And the first one is the intention. The intention has to be pure. And then the deed has to be according to what the Prophet ﷺ did and what Allah has prescribed and the Prophet ﷺ has did. Shartani li qabul al amal an niyatu wal ittiba. An niyatu wal ittiba. The intention in the following of the Prophet ﷺ. You can't come and pray two rak'ahs for Maghrib and say, hey, I prayed. And I prayed on time. And mashallah, I, I read the Baqarah and I read Ali Amran and I just, I was there for six hours. And then you, after the two rak'ahs, you say, salamu alaykum, salamu alaykum. And say, brother, you forgot the rak'ah. Get up and finish the one rak'ah. He's like, no, 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 no. I think I was doing the best salat. I was in the perfect khushua when I prayed those two rak'ahs. You were a perfect khushua to the shaitan. Because if you have perfect khushu'a without trying hard and, without, with, and with doing a bid'a and innovation, then you are praying to the shaitan. So we have to do things as Muslims according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to do. Following whom? The Prophet So these manners that we need to carry, they are mostly, or they have to pertain to our aqidah and how we worship Allah in the correct ways. And we're not going to open a, a whole subject about how to follow Allah in the perfect ways, inshallah, but Sheikh Hatta, mashallah, he's doing that and, tell, and talking about that in detail. But we want to just talk about a few manners that all of us could use a reminder about. So none of the things I'm telling you tonight are things you've never heard of. No. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ مَنْ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ that remind, that surely the reminder is going to do good for whom? The believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say the Muslim. He said the believer. And if you look at all of the ayahs of the takalif, of the orders of Islam, or takalif al shariah they were all prescribed to the believers, not the Muslims. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, idha qumtum ila salat and so forth and so on. If you look at all of the ayahs, it doesn't say, Ya ayyuhal muslimun. Because the believers are the ones, when they hear the message, when they hear the proper knowledge, they act upon it. Because they have the belief, which is the catalyst to move forward and to apply that which they heard or learned. 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ Surely you have been chosen as the greatest of peoples, of tribes, of peoples. What do you do? You promote virtue and you forbid evil. تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ and listen what he said afterwards. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ And you believe in Allah. Aren't we supposed to believe in Allah first and then promote virtue and then forbid evil? No. Because it's your duty to promote evil, to promote afun, to promote virtue and to forbid evil. And when you do that, you will reach the stages of the believers. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ By the time, Allah swears by the time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is great and He only swears by that which is great. And Allah can swear by any of His creatures and His creatures can only swear by Him. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ By the time, that the human, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the human, He didn't say the Muslims. Asri inna al-insan. That the human is surely a loser. If we stopped here, that means all of us would go to hellfire. And then comes adatul istithna, illa. Then comes the, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those who will be saved from the hellfire, the exception. Illa alladheena amanu. Those who believe. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ So if you look at these virtues, belief here means that you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you need the belief to move on. In the other ayah, it's toward, you're working towards the completion of your iman. The completion of your belief. Did I lose you? We're good? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ So they believed in Allah and then they do good deeds. They do good deeds. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ That they promote virtue and forbid evil or they remind themselves of patience. That they remind themselves of, pati of, of patience and not to do evil. So if you look at this ayah, وَالشَّافِعِي رَحِمُ الله Shafi'i said, رَحِمُ الله مِي الله be pleased with him and have mercy upon him, said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had only sent this one surah, it would have been enough proof against the people on the Day of Judgment. This one surah. Because this one surah talks about the entire of humanity, and then it breaks down, this humanity is surely going to lose. Why did he mention here belief? Because without belief, the other ones are null. So if you believe, you've saved yourself from hellfire. Dependent on how much that belief is and how much you practice that belief الصالحات, that you'll be safe from hellfire. And if you want to really be safe from hellfire, you have to promote virtue and forbid evil. So if you do these three things, that you are closer to heaven, to paradise, than he who just believes. Because we know many believers, according to the hadith, they will go to hellfire whether they have a small visit or a dinner or whatever it is they have, a million years, whatever. But many Muslims will go to hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He save us from the hellfire. Allahumma ameen. <clears throat> so, another manner that the Muslim should have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after he makes the decision to worship Allah according to the way Allah wants him to worship him, is to be thankful. And many, many, many Muslims fail to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thankful, dear brothers and sisters, in any gesture or any um, act of worship that the Muslim does as a Muslim is always tied to the intention. You could look at me and smile, but you're not intention to smile. You're just, your intention is just, just go away. 
So are you going to get reward for that? It probably hurts me more to see that it's not coming from your heart than if you just walked away and not do that. That fake smile, that phony smile. So everything is tied to your intention. All of the deeds. So when you say, you talk to Muslims today and you ask them, كيف حالك أخي? Oh, Alhamdulillah. So how's it going? You get to talk and them. Yeah, I don't know, man. I had this issue this week. I had this issue. Just get them warmed up. Once they get warmed up, they'll tell you everything. They'll tell you how unhappy they are, meaning how unthankful they are. I understand it needs patience. We're all human beings. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورٌ And very few of my servants are thankful. So, this means the majority of us are unthankful. So every single one of us now is thinking of a situation they did where they were unthankful. Including myself. And last week in the halaqa, I think the Shaykh talked about this arrida, to have acceptance when the qadr comes, when the decree is decreed upon you, that are you accepting of that? Or are you someone who's going to say, oh, why is it always me? And I tell you a story. And we all know many stories. That there was a man, and this is a true story, inshallah ta'ala, who had many boys. And every time one of his ch these boys, they would reach to the age of one, two, three years old, they would die. And it happened to three or four times. On his last child, the fourth or fifth, this young man became or got to the age of 17. So now when your son gets to 17, first of all, you're more attached. And then we all know how most of us, especially the Arabs, they have an attachment to men more than they do the girls. This is truth. Not all Muslims, but I'm talking in majority. It's even funny how your mother, she's like, did you have a boy or a girl? I want to have a boy. I mean, it's just the nature of the culture. So no offense to the sisters. I love my daughter more than my sons, but don't tell them. They're sleeping right now. <laughs> but I'm sure it'll surface one of these days. I always knew he didn't love me. Um, and what happened, this child died. So what did the man do? He went up on top of his building so he could get to the highest point in the universe, to him. And he looked up to the sky and he looked up to the heavens and he said, what do you want with me? Astaghfirullah. What do you need from me? Astaghfirullah. And while he was doing that, he slipped off the edge and he fell and he died. Now, how do you think this person died in a great state of Islam? What was he thinking as he was falling down from that building? Was he seeing the malaika of heaven? Or was he seeing the malaika of hellfire? So the thing is, is you cannot control when you will be taken. But you can control your attitude. And even if you are not thankful you can at least have acceptance. Because thankful is the highest of stages. But to have acceptance meaning that inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Everything is from Allah and everything shall go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's painful. And the Prophet sallallahu when his son Ibrahim died, he, he, he wept. Sallallahu alayhi wa So, to be somebody who is thankful. How many of you have came from overseas? Please raise your hand, just so I can know how deep to go. Okay, mashallah. So, most of us have seen how things are in what is called by the West third world countries. Because whomever is in power is the one who gets to label the other. Even though America is 33 on the grid of education. But if you compare 33 compared to the Western world, that means it's the last one on the grid. 
They can't compare it to the school like in Somalia or Djibouti or some country that really doesn't have schools. So they're comparing themselves to the ones who have schools. If the other countries had schools, they'd be like 147. And there's only 145 countries. Welcome. Anyways. So, the, those of us who came from overseas, I don't even know if we can be thankful enough. Uqsimu billah. And I talked about this last Saturday. I had a halaqa, and I just, I have to mention it every time because I think it's a duty for us to know this. When 70% of the Muslims who live in the Muslim world have never seen a buffet, whether it's to be a pitcher, they might have seen a pitcher, they might have, but they've never seen a true buffet. But when you walk in as a Muslim in America, even a poor Muslim, even a very poor Muslim, you don't even know where to start from the buffet. We walk in there and we look, that looks so good, that looks so good. Your heart starts to beat, your saliva starts to come, and you're thinking, where do I start? Where do I start? Maghrib's in 10 minutes. Oh, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا حَضَرَ الطَّعَامِ Oh, yeah, we are very, we have fiqh and we have jurisprudence like you would not believe when it comes to our desires. So now instead of eating for five minutes, they're sitting in Holy Land across the street from the masjid and they're just going at it because we have to get our money's worth. Now, what are you looking at me like you don't think like that? I fought myself for the longest time not to think like that. Because if you're raised in a Muslim country or back home, if it's free, take it. What are you going to do with it? Just take it. It's free. It's free. So when everybody jumping on the assistance at the state, even though they can afford to live without asking for a hand, that way we can feed another 100,000 Muslims that might need it or poor people. No, we got even the rich. They want the assistance. Why? Because my taxes don't show it. I'm a business owner and it's free. We're going to have to go on the tangent just for five minutes, inshallah. Wallahi, this is our mentality. You have rich people get in food stamps. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about is true, please. Khalas, I know the sister. She's involved in the building block. She knows what's up. Anyways, <laughs> but it, whatever I'm telling you, Allah is very true. Go find out for yourself if you think I'm exaggerating. It shouldn't be like that. Why is it free? Allah is going to ask you about that. And we're going to talk about the manners towards the Muslims in just a little bit, and we will talk about that. So Muslims, how can we be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? أولاً القناعة القناعة is to have an abundant mind meaning you just don't want everything is to have an abundant mind you eat a little bit alhamdulillah that's good enough and I'm not saying don't go home and eat we all have a few pounds we need to share I know, I'm talking about myself first wallahi but are we conscious of it? Do we make a istighfar after we eat at that buffet? Your soul is going to trigger you. It's going to drag you in there. Remember I need some pita bread? Oh, that buffet looks good. It don't look good. After you're done, you're sick. So, but if we can be conscious of something, because how many people, they don't know they have a disease and then they die from Like, I wish I would have known. It's too late now. So we have to be conscious of these diseases, these small things that we might think they're small, but they are big in the eyes of the Sharia, they are in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is only a test. Those people are tested with poverty, you are tested with abundance. And we all know the hadith of the, of the Prophet that the, the, the poor Muslim will enter paradise 500 years before the rich Muslim. Do you know why? The poor Muslim, he's going to have an easy judgment. 
what did you have? I had a horse or a mule and a little cow. I ate once a week. I didn't have this, I didn't have that. Oh, that's it? Khalas, it's time to go. With the Muslim who had abundance, millions of dollars, okay, where'd you get this dollar? No, it starts with the penny. And then everything, where'd you get this? How'd you do that? Two things, everything you're asked about once, except for the money. The money you asked, the, the money, where did you bring it from? And what did you spend it on? It's double whammy. It's a killer both ways. You try to steal to make more, and then you buy haram when you buy more. Subhanallah. But are we thankful? Can we be more thankful? Subhanallah. Wallahi, sometimes I sit and I, I just sit there and I pause and I say, can I ever be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I mean, from the heart. Wallahi, just sit down and count your blessings, especially if you came from overseas. If you've been overseas or you've seen people. Wallahi, I was in Egypt not too long ago. Wallahi, I've seen a man just pick up a piece of bread next to the garbage. It fell to the garbage. He was eating it right there. He didn't blow on it, take it home, wash it. He just ate it off the ground right from the garbage. Just started eating as he was picking for some other stuff at the garbage. I, that, that, that was a killer. Now I know this happens. We've all heard these stories. But when you see it, I mean, you have to make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An Mu'adh ibn Jabal, An Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked him, he said, Ya Mu'adh, do you know what the rights of Allah upon his servants is? And Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, out of respect of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. Or maybe he didn't know. In many cases, the Sahaba, they, even if they know, they say, Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam, out of respect of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Because this question is asked, so the Prophet ﷺ can actually give the answer. He's not looking for the answer. So when Mu'adh said, Allah wa Rasul Alam, that Allah and His Messenger know best, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah or the duty upon the servants of Allah or the obligation of Allah upon His servants is that they worship Him without any association. And then he asked him again, he said, do you know what the obligation of the Muslim upon Allah is? Look at how heavy this burden is. This is a very heavy burden. When you say that you have an obligation upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not because of who you are. It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets you have that obligation out of mercy. When we say obligation as well, we don't mean that's obligation, it's your right. No. Because for us to go to paradise, it's by the mercy of Allah. Even the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا أدري ما يفعل بي وما يفعل بكم إلا أن يتغمدني الله برحمته يتغمدني الله برحمته That I don't know what's going to happen to me nor to you only if Allah showers me with his, with his mercy or sends his mercy upon me mean he will send me to paradise. So when we hear this, we don't want somebody to listen and say, oh, he said shirk, he said kufr. Relax. Some things you can't just interpret right away into English. طيب. So he said that حق العبادي على الله أن يدخلهم الجنة that if they do this, if they worship Allah, without any association that Allah has promised that they will go to heaven. They will go to Jannah. It's a promise from Him. That there is no one who has more pure speech than Allah. There is no one who has more truthful speech than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See how easy it is to go to Jannah? It's knowing the truth and following the truth. Now, <clears throat> so we don't get off track, inshallah. Now, 
Some of the manners that Muslims need to be aware of are manners towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how many of us fail, even if we get to the point where we learn and dedicate learning good manners towards Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, we fail to have good manners towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the first of this, or the first of these manners that we start with, is to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, none of you will surely believe, meaning they will not arrive at the status of complete belief or the highest status in belief until I am most beloved to them than their sons and their fathers and the rest of the people or the rest of the world. Wabillahi alaykum I ask, I don't know if there's a thousand people or ten thousand or whomever, how many ever are listening on the internet right now or two hundred, whatever it is. Each one of us ask themselves, is the love of the Prophet ﷺ in your heart greater than that for your son? Meaning, would you be willing to do for the Prophet ﷺ that which you do for your children and for your parents and for your wife and so forth and so on? Do we? The easy way to find out is when you hear, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Do you say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ Or you just say, Man, that's just sunnah. How many of you hear that? That's just sunnah. Oh, that's mustahab, man. It's like, do you even know what mustahab is? Serious, I mean, wallahi. Oh, why'd you shave that? Why'd you do that? Oh, man, that's mustahab. That's sunnah. Okay. Do you even know if there's a sunnah mu'akkada, there's a sunnah wajiba, there's a sunnah... I mean, there's so many sunnahs that you're just saying sunnah. There are some mandatory sunnahs. The beard is one of them. We're not going to get into detail, but if you brothers want your sisters or daughters or wives to wear the hijab and the proper hijab, you better wear the proper lahya. Point. Let's go back to the line and start all over. It's really basic. And I applaud the sisters for going out there and taking a punch for the Muslims. Wallahi, uqsimu billah. I'm extremely proud of the sisters, especially those who can actually wear niqab, especially in this country. Because I know how hard it is to walk down the aisles. And you know, you know, every single person is not looking at you. They want to rip that hijab off of your head with their eyes. I see it and I just walk around. I walk around kafus like this. Everybody turning their head like they're just waiting. When are you going to detonate? Wallah, I had a woman tell my sister, because she's, she's, she's white and she looked like she's American, she doesn't look like she's Arab, she did this to her, like shame on you, you betrayed us. The sisters are always taking one for Islam because they look like the Muslims. And the brothers, they be, you know, one is Mo, one is Po, one is Joe. Especially all the ones that come from back home, they like to slide in under like, I'm Italian. I'm Spanish. Me, Mexican. Everybody got their thing going on. Come on, take a punch for the Muslims. And if you are married, your wife is coming home to you. She's telling you like hero stories. Like, yeah, I took one for the team. And you sitting here thinking... I have nothing to tell you. <laughs> and you're supposed to be the lion of the house. You walk around like, yeah, I'm the qawwam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I'm the man of the house. She don't think you are. Wallahi, I'm telling you the truth. She's only human. As pious as that sister would be, the shaitan's going to say, look, you be wearing this hijab, you be doing this. Look at your husband. He be sliding by, man. You get it. You're supposed to be taking the punches, going to jail, FBI, you know? I'm serious. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Say, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen and obey Allah and His Messenger, 
mean tell the people, convey to them that they should believe in Allah and follow His commandments. And the commandments of the Prophet ﷺ, Billahi alaykum. Is this ayah hard? For those of you who understand Arabic, قُلْ أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ الطَّاعَةُ تَعْنِي مَاذَا الطَّاعَةُ تَعْنِي الْإِمْتِثَالِ لِلْأَمْرِ When you say, أَطِيعُ Obey Allah and His Messenger. Does that not mean that the Prophet ﷺ does have something he's going to give us that we have to obey? Right? Common sense? Very simple? Okay, so that means there are some sunnas and there are some ahadith that mean obligation by this ayah. And there's many ayahs. فَإِن تَوَلَّوا Say, tell them to obey Allah and His Messenger. But if they turn their backs, فَإِن تَوَلَّوا Meaning if they just say, it's just sunnah. Wallahi, it's, this is what the ayah is talking about. When I read this ayah, it's as if I'm listening to some Muslims that I've talked to, many of them. Unfortunately, most of them are in Muslim countries. They say this. And then they, everybody knows they can talk about deen these days. Wallahi, I challenge. If we ask the Muslims about certain medications, if you say if you have a headache, everybody will tell us you can take ibuprofen, you can take aspirin. Ibuprofen is bad for your stomach, aspirin is bad for your heart, or vice versa, whatever it is. Everyone has some kind of contradiction there, or contraindication, is that what it's called? Anyways, everyone has some kind of side effect. And Muslims know this. If something's this, oh, take this medicine, take that medicine, do this medicine. How many Muslims have 20, 30 years of medicine experience? The cabinet's full of medicines. Here, take a Novocaine. What's this for? Oh, this one I had that operation six years ago, but it's okay. Okay, I'll take it. We just, we're good at that. I guarantee you we know more about medication and, and these things, these worldly things, than we do about our deen. It's guaranteed. And if you're thinking, no, not me, revise your thought process. If somebody came to you that was non-Muslim and told you, what does it mean to be a Muslim? Where would you start? Ask yourself. Each one of us should ask themselves. Because it could happen. Each one of us should be able to explain in front of a large audience and to everybody we know, what does it mean to be Muslim? Muslim is the greatest man. You're going to go to Jannah. He doesn't believe that. You need to give him something that's going to convince, something that is prescribed in the Quran. If you don't know this, because there are many things that are to be known in this deen by obligation. By obligation. مَا يُعْرَفُ مِنَ الدِّينِ بِالضَّرُورَةِ What is to be known in this deen by obligation upon you. For instance, if you are the age of puberty, you need to know how to perform salah. It's a must upon you. You can't say, I'm a Muslim. Hey, nobody ever showed me. It's a must. It will be judged about that. If you have enough money to make zakah, you need to know the duties and the ahkam of zakah and so forth and so on. How many of us, if you ask them about our particular job, we know more about that than we do just the basics of Islam. I'm not telling you to get and teach fiqh and teach aqid. No, we're talking about basic things that all of us should be able to convey. First of all, to remind each other. And second of all, to talk to non-Muslims that might or might not ask us. How many sisters know this? Some woman will see you at Cup Foods or at the store or whatever. She'll come to you and say, are you Muslim? Or why? Some will even ask, why do you wear that? They don't even, they're so disconnected. Why are you dressed like that? So what do you say? Well, yeah, didn't you hear I was Muslim? Don't you know? Have you seen us on TV? We blow up. This joke. <laughs> Anyways. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you obey Allah and His Messenger, I know Shaykh Hatim, mashallah, is perfect and calm, and I'm, I'm just, <laughs> Allahu alam what happens next. قُلْ أَطِعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ فَإِن تَوَلَّوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ That Allah, if they turn their backs on you, O Muhammad, that tell them that Allah does not like the disbelievers. Meaning when you say, oh, it's just sunnah, you've already been categorized as a non-Muslim. Or, you have been categorized as somebody that does things 
that non-Muslims do. Subhanallah. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ يَعْنِ إِنَّ هُمَّ دَخَلُوا فِي الْكُفْرِ Meaning that they went into kufr based on what they said. They could have said, you know what? I believe in the Qur'an and I don't believe in the Sunnah. This is kufr. Or they could say, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, isn't there a lot of hadith? So now they're speaking like those who commit kufr. So it could be looked at in both ways. And Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالْ لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ آه. وَعَمِلَ وَدَارَ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا نو. وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا عفوا. وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا That those um, نعم لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ That surely there has been for you a great example in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A great or the greatest of examples in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for those whom what? For those who are in search, for those who are in pursuit, for those, لأن الكلمة يرجو in Arabic has two meanings. يرجو means they wish. أو يرجو means that they are actually pursuing. That they are in the pursuit of the hereafter in the last day, meaning the Jannah. And then he said, What? And that they remember Allah a lot. Because for those who are following this path, they would have to be of those who remember Allah. They have to be of those who have the greatest manners with Allah that they will not commit shirk. They will follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated them to do or ordained upon them. They will follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that they will be in a constant stage of reminder or of remembrance, Ya Rabb, of remembrance. And what is some of the remembrance? We just talked about a virtue of remembrance, a shukr, thankfulness. Because when you say alhamdulillah, this is remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> now, وَذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا that, they, that their remembrance for Allah is abundant. This is the only way they can stay on track. This is the only way they can stay away from the fitna of the dunya. Because when you are in remembrance, you're not going to talk nonsense. You're not going to do ghiba, backbiting, namima. You're not going to do these things if you're always in a constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worse yet, some of the things that most of us Muslims do today is we sit and we watch the news for hours and hours and hours. And when they used to teach us in business a long time ago, they said, are you important to the point that you can change the news? If the answer is no, you should not watch the news. Look at this is what the kuffar say. If you can't change the news, means if you don't have the authority to change the news, means to change the outcome, then why are you watching it? At 8 o'clock you've heard the news, khalas, for the rest of the day, it's going to be the same thing over and over. Oh, don't forget, this guy came in with a really good point at 5 p.m. So from 8 to 5, I can't miss that guy. He could be anywhere in between. Allah's not going to ask you about the news. He's going to ask you about that time. What did you spend it on? Were you remembering Allah a lot? Or were you remembering your desires a lot? Because each one has a different way their desires pull them towards what they want to do. If they are politically inclined, they're going to sit there and watch the news all day and follow this channel and that channel and then this and that and read all the newspapers so they know everything. If you ask a lot of Muslims, they know about all the presidents, all the new delegates, all the cabinet members. They know everything. But they don't know the Ashra Mubasharuna Bil Jannah. They don't know the ten that the Prophet ﷺ has promised them paradise in this dunya. They don't even know ten Sahabis in a row. They might even forget the Khulafa al Rashidun.
And the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-mar'u yuhsharu ma'a man yuhib. That the human will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment with those whom he loves. So be very careful. When you say, I love somebody, I love this guy so much. He's a really good guy. But he's a soccer player that is non-Muslim. Or he's a politician that is non-Muslim. Or he's a bad politician who's Muslim and did a lot of things. Like some presidents that passed on. We're not going to talk about none of that. But you say, man, I love that guy. If you say you love him, be careful because you will be resurrected with him. If you say, oh, no, I don't, you know what? I don't want to be resurrected with him. Then you shouldn't love him. It's a very basic concept. So you choose who you love or you say you love. The Prophet ﷺ says, عن أبي هرير رضي الله عنه, and all these hadiths are either in Bukhari or Muslim. Inshallah Ta'ala, they are all authentic, bi'idhnillah. كل أمة يدخلون الجنة إلا من أبا. The entirety of my ummah, of my people, will enter paradise only those who refuse. Abu Huraira was shocked. He said, وَمَنْ يَأْبَى يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Who will refuse to enter paradise? Who in the right mind will refuse to enter paradise? And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ تَبِعَ سُنَّتِي فَقَدْ أَحَبَّنِي وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَى So if you follow my commandments or my sunnah, that means you love me, that you will enter paradise with me. But if you disobey and turn away, that means you turn away from Jannah. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah, that the Prophet وسلم, is dearer to the Muslims than themselves. That the Prophet Arhamu Bina Min Anfusina. That he is more merciful upon us than we are to ourselves. And that's why we need to love him more than we love ourselves. فَقَالَ مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَقَدْ أَبَى صلى الله عليه وسلم عن أنس رضي الله عنه he said لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه we talked about this من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين that you will surely not believe meaning you will reach, reach the highest status of belief until you love the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم more than your son your father and the entirety of humanity or the nasi ajma'in and the rest of the people or the humanity. And the last manner I want to talk about, inshaAllah ta'ala, is our manners towards ourselves, towards the Muslims. First of all, we need to understand if somebody says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, we need to love them because they are Muslims. We love them as a Muslim. We might hate the, the, the ma'asiyah they do, the things they do, and our love for them is, to, is in total accordance with their closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't say that we love a alim like we love a fasiq. We can't say that. Because the Prophet ﷺ says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب حتى يحب لأخيه منصوبة بعد حتى حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه that surely none of you will believe until you love for your brother and he did not say the believer your brother الأخوة the brotherhood starts with لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله starts with Islam in Islam is you saying لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله you open the door to enter into Islam and then belief is when you start to apply and obey. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Surely you will not believe, none of you will believe, meaning that they will reach the highest status of belief. That until he loves for his brethren that which he loves for himself, and like we said, this applies to the brothers and the sisters, inshaAllah ta'ala. And if you were to be asked, what does this hadith mean? Most of us will probably understand it in a, in a different way. And when we ask, what does it mean that you love the brother? What you love for yourself? So meaning if I buy a bottle of water, I have to buy all of you a bottle of water? 
What if I can't afford it? Then I just give you the bottle of water and I stay without. Is that a solution? I know, but then you have to do the same. So now we both die of thirst. You give it to me, I give it to you, and nothing really happens, nobody benefits. Is that what that means? Does it mean every time you buy something, you buy it for the whole neighborhood? No. But when you see your brother drive in a brand new car or a nice car or have a nice house, you say, where do you get that from? Now, he just came from, he just came from back home like six months ago. How, he can, how can he afford that car? Al-Hasad. See his sister getting married to a good brother. How'd she marry that brother? Man, I know more Quran than her. You might know more Quran than her, but may, maybe Allah loves her more than he loves you. So how many people have memorized the Quran and they do things, وَالْعِيَذُ billah. So, but when you see, you say, Bismillah, mashallah, ba Allahumma barak lah. And if you want like that, say, Oh Allah, give me from that which you have given Fulan. Oh Allah, I have nothing in my heart towards him. That's the true love. Not because he has a nice car, and then some people they go to the extreme. They go and start asking, Well, what's going on? What is he working? He just got here. You guys don't have this in your community? No? Is it just only in the Arab community? I'm half Arab, that's why I'm, most of the time I'm half, half of the time I'm on time and the other half I'm not. Allahu Musta'an. Sometimes I'm on Arab standard time, sometimes I'm on Muslim good time. Alhamdulillah. Bad habits. Anyways, so we have no hasad for the brother. This is a duty that we have towards our brother and our sister in Islam. So when you hear some of the mashaykh, they say, Wallahi inni uhibbukum fillah. They say, oh, Wallahi, I love you all for the sake of Allah. At first, you know, when I was first starting out in, in my journey of seeking knowledge, I would sit there and say, he doesn't even know me. How does he love me? That really perturbed me. I thought that was just, that was just talk, you know, that was just talk. And then I started to realize, it's like, okay, he has to love all Muslims. No matter how big or small, there has to be a Muslim, a, a, a love for the Muslim, no matter what they do, no matter who they are. You love them because they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Hassan al Basri rahimahullah. He was walking, I hope it's the scholar, if I made a mistake, I apologize. He was walking down the street and he saw a man who was on the ground and laying there drunk. Is it get any worse than that? And he was drunk and he was saying, Allah, Allah, Allah. And people were just walking by, whether they kick the dust at him or the sand or they look at him or they say, oh, this guy, he's a drunk, he's a drunkard, don't worry about him. And they just left him there.